Kia ora, welcome everybody to the Cardinal District Council Regulatory and Compliance Committee meeting. I just need to remind everybody that we are live streaming and, um, and anybody that objects to that? Okay, welcome again everybody and you'll have to forgive me, we have come from a really excellent assurance risk and finance workshop session and I haven't had a chance to socialise um, with the general manager of this committee that I was going to talk about um, how people can be prepared in the COVID um, surge that's happening in our communities. Um, Natahine Health Trust did up this wonderful um, keeping your house safe, who's in your bubble, um, things to know about your health if you had an ambulance officer come and you can't talk, um, having that information handy. So um, I'm going to take for this, I don't know what else to do with it in regard to the committee, but I also wanted to um, prompt that, um, you know, it would be really good if we could um, share this information more publicly. Perhaps our comms team, I'm not sure, I think we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, uh, working on something for our ourselves. Yes, Council I'll Research? I'll take in the table. Oh, table. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Dr. Dean, is there anything you want to take a moment to raise with the committee before we get into our agenda? Um, <laughs> Madam Chair, looking about the COVID position, or, yes. oh, um, I, 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 can, I can update the committee that we are working very hard to uh, gear up for the traffic light system, which commences on Friday, and we will be making some recommendations, I some recommendations with tomorrow. And it is very late in the piece, but we believe that, you know, we're quite confident that we'll be able to come Friday to adopt the approach across council. Um, a short while ago, I was in discussions with Mark Osborne uh, from the Te Ahu uh, Trust, and Te Ahu presents some challenges in terms of how we manage that facility. There's multiple entrances, multiple facilities um, shared with the trust, and um, so we need to be clear about what the arrangements are in that regard. As far as the community uh, preparedness is concerned, certainly um, something we can promote, and they have been certainly promoting amongst our staff in terms of their preparedness and then sharing that information more, more, more widely. Um, so, yeah, we need to take the guess factor out of out of what the COVID light of the uh, <coughs> will mean, because uh, I think some people are still a little, little confused about how that will work in practice. So we'll be ready for Friday. Um, I can't elaborate too much at this point because we haven't really um, had the opportunity to discuss that, but we will do that. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, more generally, Madam Chair, you did um, want to, at the end of the committee, discuss with members um, work in, any work program. Yeah. Yeah. But so that's more an uh, informal discussion following the committee. Yeah, awesome. Do you require staff to be vaccinated, or is that not decided? We, we, yeah. haven't, um, we haven't mandated that staff will be um, need to be vaccinated on mass. But what we have done is identify the high risk roles. That process is underway. We are consulting with staff, public, uh, public facing, yes, um, so our librarians, people at the front counters, who in customer service, uh, and so on. Um, also, building inspectors will go physically go into the field, animal management officers, and so on. So all of those high risk roles have been identified. What we are doing currently is working through with them in a consultative um, process 
um, what that means for them. If it so happens that they are unvaccinated and that's their position and say the right to have that view, then we need to go to redeployment possibilities and ultimately if that doesn't work out then it means uh, you know, no, no ongoing employment. But we think that that is the, in the minority of cases. We don't believe that there's a large contingent of staff in the high risk roles that we're talking about that will then no longer be available um, to, to perform services. But um, that, that is a work in progress as we speak. We're just working through that. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Let's move on to our agenda. And um, for those that may be with us on YouTube, there are copies of, agenda, of our agenda available on our website. Um, so item 4.1. The item is that the Regulatory Compliance Committee confirms, oh, actually I've forgotten, apologies, thank you. I have not received official absent from Okay, yep, we've had one from Neil Carter and we've got one for lateness from Councillor Smith and that's us. Can I have a mover please? I'll move. Okay, we've got research and court. Sorry. Okay, now we'll move on to item 4.1. That the Regulatory Compliance Committee confirms that the minutes of the meeting of the committee held 12 October 2021 are a true and correct record. I didn't have any issues with them myself. Did anybody else? Okay, all those in favour? Thank you. It's because I'm used to the boxes on the screen coming up. Would you like to that? <laughs> no, that's okay. And all those in favour, we already did. Thank you. All right, moving on to the juicy report of trade waste monitoring. And the recommendation is that the Regulatory Compliance Committee receive the report trade waste monitoring. May I have a mover and a seconder, please? Melinda Ward and Councillor Collard, thank you. Awesome. And Rochelle, did you want to say anything about this report to start with? The floor is yours. So I trust everyone has read the report, so um, if not, just a brief um, history that uh, at the October bylaw hearing meeting, a submission was given uh, to Jess Garnham of um, Natai Order on the on-site waste order disposal system. As a result of the submission, um, a report was requested to look at the frequency of issues uh, concerning grease traps and trade waste reported that was being reported to Council. Um, so, section 15 of the RMA and section 124 of the Building Act that gives Council the authority to, needs to deal with failing and any malfunctioning or le um, leaking on site waste systems. Um, grease traps are used by commercial businesses in their wastewater, um, and the building consent is required to install one. Um, and G13 of the Building Go Code um, does address this. Um, there are two, two scenarios relating to grease traps. The first, um, that it can be discharged to a town sewer, um, in which case infrastructure and asset management must be satisfied with the design and it's just and it's discharged. Um, and the second um, is that to an on-site grease trap um, to a private system, which is, in, in this case, the manufacturer must be satisfied that the system will meet design outputs. Um, so over the last four and a half years, which I can look for records, there haven't been any complaints received for trade waste um, or grease traps. 
Um, and building compliance weren't able to uh, run any reports. However, they um, do say that the number of queries uh, relating uh, to grease traps are very uncommon and is usually limited to our environmental health team uh, where one has required maintenance, perhaps. Our compliance administration um, don't maintain grease traps, um, so they don't send out reminder letters as they do with um, OSDs. Um, however, if the contractor um, contacts uh, the customer and it gets sent in to us, we do uh, lodge that against um, the council records. And we currently have about 200 grease traps in current status on our, on our records. Uh, the environmental health um, team, they're not required during their food verifications, they're not required to actually specifically look at um, the grease traps. However, if they do note one that does need a ding, they will ask the operator to do that. So it's Thank not you. my area of specialty, this. <laughs> I saw Mr. Finch sit up when you started talking. Does <laughs> it? Um, do members have any questions? Yeah, can I ask about the vet grease traps? The grease traps that the council are interested in, are they solely ones that are collect, uh, connected to our wastewater systems as opposed to potentially grease traps in here, like a fish to the shop, perhaps, that's not. <laughs> Would we be interested in uh, We would be more interested, sorry, it's really chair, um, more interested in if it's connected to the town sort yeah. um, line. Uh, Is that, are those ones included in the 200 that I mentioned? Yes, they are. Thank you, Your Council of Research. Then yeah, I had a question around, uh, which comes from the comment on page 24, where the public consideration statement says the effective implementation of this bylaw should be considered part of, a, of preventing contaminations of stormwater, water bodies, and move towards sustainable outcomes and improving of well-being of the whānau communities. Um, and what my concern was is the practical nature of all of this. I think looking at um, waste um, from especially rural based industries and those that are not connected to a sewer system um, would, you know, because that, that's already some treatment process, would be um, best treated through a final and managed source as a mitigation because to take stormwater and try and treat it and protect waterways, you're talking about volumes that are so in excess, I doubt with even Auckland series plant can cope with the volumes in its treatment. So in terms of trying to achieve some of these objectives, um, I would think that a goal was quite important. So we're not discussing the bylaw, this is just a response. I know, I know, I know, but I'm just, it just, I'm just wanting to know if that has been considered, given what's happening with the three waters and storm waters and then quality of streams and so on, and what likely impact is going to be thrown on, on us. Probably it's a big question for just this one report, but I'm just a bit, a bit nervous about the future impacts that we might be, as a community, facing. Rochelle, um, can you respond to that today, or do you want to bring that back? I'm going to chair, I would need to bring that back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, fair enough, I, I, I don't want to put you on the spot there. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellent report. I note that we only have 200 grease traps in total in the district, and that Section 15 of the RMA and Section 124 of the Building Act give you, as regulatory, the regulatory enforcing authorities, all the powers you need to, um, to make sure that these systems are functioning. Uh, I do note that we had one submission from the Public Health Department of the Northland District Health Board in response to our on-site wastewater disposal by law seeking that we implement a trade waste uh, by law. But having read the report and considering the hump, as our Chief Executive refers to it, the, the battle wave of work facing us, I'm satisfied that we have appropriate systems, processes and policies in place to deal with this and I would like to just receive the report and let it die a death at this point. I do not see 
they're eating their and consuming resources for a viral that um, would only duplicate regulatory functions that you're already empowered to give effect to. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, perhaps it might be helpful for Darren to respond to the resolution that was at SPP on this final because it was left to lie on the table. No, come back to that as well. I, I think, Madam, Madam Chair, if I look at the report, um, the bylaw revoked some time ago. Yeah, and, and, and it hasn't been in the work program. I, I've asked I've asked to look at if it could be reintroduced to the work program and get picked up through that cycle. I think in the meantime, picking up from the Court's comments, um, there is nothing in place at the minute, uh, and perhaps that is a, is a point of managing until it is picked up through the work program. Thank you, Darren. Um, Mr. Finch, did you want to throw in an infrastructure type view to this? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just um, really just like to point out that, um, as you'll be aware, as a free water portfolio, the number of uh, overflows and spills that result of fat being poured down the reticulation, and you'll be well aware of the one, the, the frequency at which that occurs and the cost of feeding those. So I'm, I'm fully supportive of anything we can do to deter people to putting the fat down the system, really. Mm. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Finch. So um, the resolution is to receive this report. Um, I think any direction on the bylaw would need to be in a corridor with Darren and Council Smith or at, at the SPP committee meeting um, because we, we didn't have one submission in total we had. 16 that don't want it, I wonder why, and um, two that supported, I'm oh, sorry, 16 that didn't support the, the changes and two that supported. So anyway, we're not here to discuss the bylaw, <laughs> we'll leave that, but we will um, just move on with this report. All those in favour? Aye. Thank you. Okay, alcohol licensing update number 5.2. And the recommendation is that the Regulatory Compliance Committee receive the report alcohol licensing update. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Belinda and Councillor Vesic. Thank you. And Rochelle has got a lovely slideshow for us on this as well. Oh, I need to. <laughs> January to the 31st of October, which is the period since the last report on alcohol licences. Um, during that time, there have been a total of 197 alcohol licences issued. Um, that's an increase of 50 licences on the same period for last year. Um, and the most uh, licences have been issued within the Bay of Islands uh, ward with 114. Uh, there have been uh, 54 special licences applied for and issued between this period, um, compared with 64 for the same period last year. Uh, there's been an incredible um, decrease in the number of special licence applications over the past 18 months, and that's very likely due to the uncertainty in holding events uh, with our COVID-19 restrictions. 
there were 110 new or renewed licenses um, compared to 70 from the previous year. And for the period of 1st January to 31 October, there were a total of 326 managers to the issue, compared to 249 issued between the same period last year. Um, 152 of those were new certificates and 174 renewals. On, off club and managers license renewals uh, on the end have increased, which is encouraging for premises continuing to operate in the district. Uh, for the same period, there were seven objections um, received against five applications. All of those objections were subsequently withdrawn and the, uh, the licenses were issued. Um, the DRC, District Licensing Committee, hearing outcomes have resulted in one licence granted, one licence refused and one decision appealed. And that's currently for the um, Alcohol Regulatory Licensing Authority for determination. Um, the EH, uh, the Environmental Health Services team, they have an um, important role of promoting and improving our community's knowledge and understanding of the legislative requirements relating to alcohol licensing. Um, they've been incredibly proactive in this space um, this year, increasing the education knowledge as well as building stronger relationships. Um, <clears throat> They uh, just published, and that went out yesterday actually, uh, the first summer alcohol newsletters, um, and will be circulating quarterly newsletters um, seasonally. Um, all the alcohol application forms were reviewed during September and October, and they've been um, updated and made to be more um, customer friendly. And um, Christina Rosenfeld, who's the team leader for environmental um, health, she um, organised an event organisers workshop um, and that's held in October. It was a webinar um, that provided event organisers with all the information that they needed um, to hold an event in our district. So there were various council staff, um, there were obviously the environmental health services team which did the food and alcohol side of things, um, as well as district facilities for event permits, uh, NTA were there for traffic management plans and road safety, resource consents um, and funding is also there, um, and reporting agencies, New Zealand Police, Ministry of Health and Fire and Emergency. Um, the team webinar went down very well. So. Thanks very much, Rochelle. Any comments or questions? <coughs> Council yes. Kinder? I was just curious, there's a help on special licences, which is understandable, but an overall increase. Where have those extra licences gone? That's the nature of them. Fifty more than there were previously. I was just wondering if there aren't that many new bars or cafes or anything open. Um, I wouldn't be able to know exactly where they have all come from, but I can certainly get that information for you. Yeah, I'd be curious as the same just um if any businesses are closing rather than opening I was thought in hospital. And she'll have corrected it. Yes, please do. The sale and supply of alcohol that came into effect in 2012 and all licences were reissued under the new legislation. So a brand new licence has a one year probationary period and after that we're on a three year cycle. By 2021 we're coming to the three year cycle. So what you're seeing, you'll see in every third year is an increase of licence numbers just part of the rotation, not necessarily new ones. Not just from new ones. Thank you. Any other questions on this report? Yes, Belinda? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, could you have a um, time frame on, there's a lot of community interest on the pick and pitch, um, Appeal, decision being appealed. Is, do we have a date or is that still an on by? Not that I'm aware of, but I can check that out for you. Thank you. Uh, and the other uh, query I had was Suja at the beginning of the summer season, um, council staff and, and myself always met with the police to discuss the look of vans in the, for the summer season in the um, public places areas in particular. Are we still doing that? And are we still putting supply and putting liquor ban stickers on our rubbish tins on our beachfronts and parks and museums? 
as a deterrent. Who would like that through? Um, we, we have been doing um, foot patrols and putting uh, the, uh, stickers on the rubbish bins uh, in certain areas of uh, the uh, Those have been implied here in Russell uh, throughout the um, Mongolia, Cooper's Beach, and those areas. So I'm not sure if it's been completed, but um, through the summer, that we've been. Um, there is also um, tri agency meetings held monthly with the police and the environmental um, services team as well as the district track board. Um, so they have um, great um, sharing of knowledge in those meetings. Um, I guess my other concern, Madam Chair, is around um, New Year and the potential of um, a massive influx of um, particularly freedom campus. Um, and FITs once Auckland opens up. Um, I believe there is not going to be organised um, New Year's Eve fireworks this year in Paihe, which draws huge numbers of people. And I'm just wondering what plans, if any, are in place for the, um, the revelers. And uh, as I think this year is going to be completely different to, what, to the organised um, chaos we normally have. Chair, I don't think we can answer that question. We don't organise events as such. Um, I'm not sure that there's anything on the programme from the council events, sponsored events perspective. I'm aware that a lot of Christmas um, parades, etc., have been cancelled. Um, Darren, would you? I, I think it's more along the lines of you know, these are public spaces. What's council going to be doing to help address the um, undesirable drinking behaviour that happens in these public spaces. Well, Madam Chair, I don't think there's a lot we can do other than liaise with police and um, try to, you know, influence the situation. Police are always stretched for resources, but if if they can't deal with the situation in terms of public safety and public behaviour, etc., etc., then um, we certainly don't have the the resources, you know, uh, and, and neither is it, I would argue, neither is it our role as local government to ensure that people are safe and deal with brawls on the streets, and et cetera. Um, it is a police, a policing um, role. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, normally we have taken a collaborative approach and met with police uh, prior to, that's why I was asking, are we doing, what's the plan this year, are we putting the stickers on the bins, are we, you know, because normally there, there is a lot of, uh, you know, sort of preempting and mitigating of, of um, trashing of the towns when there's no organised entertainment. So, uh, mm -hmm. why I'm asking is, is because we perhaps need to, even though it's a civil police issue, we need to maybe initiate some discussions promptly to, um, yeah. I guess yeah. try, try and mitigate some of our yeah. um, issues that I expect to see in public spaces. I tend to agree with you, Mr. Ward. Madam yes. Chair, we certainly can do that. Yeah. Um, I was really referring to the role of the on-street presence uh, in terms of dealing right. with the situation. I know that a lot of um, bar owners, um, etc., have, uh, and police have, have um, rallied and, and involved Maori wardens. Um, and taken those steps along with people who are, you know, the security on the door at different establishments to try to deal with that situation both on the premises and when they spill out into the street at midnight or one o'clock in the morning um, to actually help facilitate that as well. So, yes, certainly we, we can have those discussions with the police to see what we can we can facilitate. Thank you. I'd be quite happy to be involved um, if required to try and um, work through the problems. Thank you. Ladies first, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for this report, Rochelle. We just note on page 34, and it's a topic of conversation that's come up before, but some really good commentary around the challenges that the uh, licensing committee faces, especially in terms of the expertise that are now required uh, and the the legal challenges. And I'm just wondering, um, I was hoping that in the what changes to practices and procedures under the Act would you find beneficial, there'd be some recommendations on how we could look to address that. And I guess my question is, 
is there any opportunity, especially perhaps from an LGNZ remit point of view, to look at advocating to ensure that that local, the intention of the act is secured? Um, it may well be a case of the fact that our, our legislation writers are certainly, are certainly not aware of those challenges. So I'm just wondering if there's opportunity there uh, to do more in that space. Yeah. Um, yes, quite possibly there is. Um, I just need to look into that a little bit. Um, just secondary to that, then, that it would be really great if we could look to progress, especially through that remit process. So I think the intention is to have a governance workshop on potential remits early in the new year, uh, and then maybe the uh, Council of Waters, the chair, might like to lead that process and look to see if there's any improvements we could make. Did you respond to that? Yeah. My words, not Rochelle. So I know, I can tell So, I, as chair of the District Liquor Licensing like Committee, I'm required to provide comments uh, in an annual report back to Harla. So, Rochelle's team does an excellent job of collating all the pieces of this and data, and that goes back to Harla, and I'm required to comment on observations and trends. So, those are those are my, my comments. Uh, it's been, as I said, the Act came into effect in 2012 and it significantly changed the way alcohol is sold in New Zealand. I just need to make a correction at this point, not fresh in mind. A new licence is also a sale. That might be, we've had a lot of sales. Business is changing hands. Uh, and Councillor Stratford now sits as. Um, the deputy chair of the committee, and it is not at all unusual that we turn up to a hearing and we're up against their assistance on the Citizen Friends Council. It's become extremely litigious. We are often appealed on points of law. Um, the judge always slams us, uh, and we find that quite interesting because we're not lawyers, and we're not meant to be lawyers. The Act is quite clear that it's meant to be uh, local community people making local community decisions. So we're having, we're having to become um, lay lawyers. It's moving on at such a rapid pace, it's quite frightening, and I'll just give you an example. Um, we've just recently done a webinar on human trafficking, it's not something you'd expect to hear in New Zealand, is it? 40%, according to the Department of Labour, 40% of all off-licence bottle stores in New Zealand are engaged in human trafficking. Uh, so we now ask to consider, and I've forwarded all my notes to Dr Dean, um, we're now required to ask for employment contracts for all of your employees. Confidence that they're being paid the minimum wage, confidence that they're getting their 10 minute break and the annual leave. The webinar, did you sit in on that webinar? No, I missed that one. Um, we're taking through training now where uh, we're hearing some quite horrific things, and because we're live streaming, I'm not going to tell you what these horrific things are that we talk about, um, but they are significant abuses of human rights and I find that quite scary. Mm. Um, so it's stepping up the requirements on the decision makers but equally it's stepping up the requirements on Rochelle and her team um, into what they're required to investigate prior to an application coming to, to the committee. And to be fair, we are a council, we're not the Department of Labour, we're not immigration New Zealand and we're not the police and yet those burdens and responsibilities are now falling on us to address. Mm. So I think Councillor Smith has raised something that's quite pertinent um, and what a remit might look like but I think it would be far more wide ranging than mm. what your initial thought pattern is. Mm. Thank you very much. Oh, can, I, can I just add just in case people online are like what's that got to do with it? it? It's a lot to do with it because if they if they're not suitable as an employer, 
they're not suitable to hold a license. Sorry, Councillor Clinton. Yes. Oh, sorry, before you do, I missed Councillor Collard. He was next. Yeah, I wanted to just comment on a couple of things. First, I'll stick my hand up. I've just recently reapplied for my manager's certificate, so that is a little conflict there, um, but I'm not talking about that. <coughs> I think that we're going to have, or the community is going to have great. Um, gatherings of people because of a lack of places to go. Now, what I mean by that, Auckland is opening up on the 15th of December, which means that they will be able to come north if they so desire. But what, I, what would concern me is there's no places for them to go. I know the Matai Bay camp has been closed. There's restrictions at all the very far north uh, camps to 100 people who've all traditionally held three to 500. Uh, where are all these people going to be? Uh, if there are restrictions in terms of licensed premises, they're going to be on the street and outside the car park. I think that we're um, potentially in for a problem type Christmas New Year. Now that comes from 40 years of experience in business and knowing what can happen and what potentially will happen. Thank you. Uh, Hear what um, uh, Dr. Dean says uh, that it's not for us to police that. However, we do need to be aware. Of Madam Chair, if I may, um, the question came up through our Chief Executive about secondary roads in the district, um, and who would intervene, if that's the right word, if there were issues in allowing access to popular beaches, etc., and this is particularly with regards to uh, road road checks checkpoints, um, the police have assured us that they see it as their role and that we have no role in that. Um, that said, it, um, to Councillor Collard's, uh, Collard's point, um, we certainly do need to uh, be aware that there may be issues across. The question is, what is our role in that? Um, police will be stretched. I don't think they are appropriately resourced to deal with all situations on the roads and off the roads. Um, so, and, and on all accounts, the uh, anecdotal evidence is that a lot of Aucklanders are booking, are coming north for a holiday. So they will arrive in numbers. So yeah, something we should you know, be aware of and certainly prepare to the extent that we can. Um, we liaise closely with police and the Northern District Health Board um, on this whole COVID scenario uh, and the unfolding picture of traffic lights and so on. So we, we certainly need to liaise and, and collaborate to the extent that we can. Um, where that places our staff, um, there's, there's a question there, and that, that was, I referred to my earlier comment in response to the question. You know, do we specifically put staff into scenarios? Um, we need to be cautious about that. That would be my advice. Um, putting staff into a scenario where it's not our role um, may be problematical, but nevertheless, we, we will continue working with, with other agencies to see how we can play our part. Thank you. Um, Sorry, can I just add something to that? Sure. Where I, I see the um, potential problems being is that our existing licensed premises will be looking to maximise their position as far as they are allowed to. Now that means advertising. And if it's advertising, all people see it. So there will be 100, 200 people inside and 300 outside. Uh, how they're going to deal with that would be a great deal of interest. And that's not just my we're now starting to put in occupancy and be loss on all applications. Uh, so if we identify that a building has an occupancy of 80 people, it actually becomes a condition of their consent. They can't have more than 80 people in the building. There's also section 106 of the Act, which is amenity and good order, which means that the licensee is responsible for what happens outside their premise, even if it's not within their legal title or their 
limited area or their licensed area, and this particularly goes to the problems we have in Kings Road, where you cannot allow people to congregate on the road and drink alcohol and be a public nuisance. That goes to the heart of suitability, and you can lose your license for that. Potentially, we'll be having more lost licenses if that's the case. Thank you. Madam Chair of the DLC. Um, <laughs> it's Councillor Clendon. I'm just taking a think I'm going to go to Auckland for Christmas. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, just thinking on Anne's comments. So this trade with the industry for a long time has been infamous for abuse of employment rights, particularly when people's employment is tagged to one employer. This is very often they are people lose their rights that way, but Putting that aside, if this is a problem, and it obviously is, that this uh, litigious approach to it, that might be something LGNZ should be talking to the law society about. Simply to say, look, this is, you did right, that where there's a, a dispute or a debate about interpretation of the law, it should go back to what did Parliament intend. And if there was intended, as I believe it was, that local, yeah, local community should determine the operation of liquor outlets, then that should be respected. So as I say, that would be my word. The LGNZ to talk on behalf of the sector to law society. The judges are kind of a law unto themselves. But through the law society, that would be the point of entry, I think, to make the case that this is not being interpreted the way the law is intended. Kia ora, thanks for that, Councillor Clinton. Yes, Rochelle. Madam Chair, I just um, just wanted to add that although it's not the um, inspector role to sort of manage you know, drinking on the streets and everything like that, for any organised events that we do know of with special licences, that if they do go ahead um, over the new year period, such as the music festivals and things like that, uh, our inspectors do go to those um, events and check that the uh, licence conditions aren't being met, so they go along with the um, police, such as the uh, 660 concert last year. Um, and uh, so they are checking that you no know, alcohol, and that they're only providing the X amount of drinks to people and um, can shut, shut down for this. Thank you for that, Rochelle. I'm really sorry. Down the back there, Will, you had something you wanted to add. Uh, thank you, I'm Madam sorry. Chair. Uh, without taking members down a rabbit hole, I'm really interested in the comments, the, diff the very different comments in terms of subject matter, what, what they had in common between uh, Belinda and the, the, the Deputy Mayor. And that was around a lack of joined upness. And it's a drum beat you've heard me bang before, but we've got the ideal opportunity in March when the Future for Local Government team come here and they ask us what we're looking for. I think that is what we're looking for. We're looking for some mechanism to bring all the moving parts of the state together to work with our communities, because at the moment, clearly, we don't have that. Yes, thank you for that. And that's awesome observation, Will. Yes, Councillor Research, finally. Sorry. Um, something that was said just to raise a bit of a, a red flag for me, and that is, if the liquor license is going to be responsible for outside their premises uh, legally, they may be put in a position that they can't enforce it and therefore lose their license. So I actually like what Will's saying that as, as a community as a whole, if we've got the respective government departments around and those that have the powers to actually enforce some of these things really together, it may be achievable. So the PT you define the responsibility. Um, Otherwise, it's going to be hard to get from me. So there's more to come from the MGM. But I like there's a solution that we as local mm -hmm. government can look at, and that's all in those parts of you. Thank you. Yeah. We've already been told that there's stretch at that time of the year to mm -hmm. hot spots, and which means there are other spots with no heat at all. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, excellent point raised, Councillor Smith. Thanks for that report, Rochelle. Um, all those in favour? Aye. Thank you. Now we're on to item 1.3. Update for environmental services monitoring and compliance. And the recommendation is that the regulatory compliance can be received the report, update report, environmental services 
monitoring and compliance. Can I have a mover? Nobody wants it. Okay, Councillor Collard. And Member Ward, thank you so much. Um, did you want to speak to this? Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, so this um, is an update um, around the monitoring and resource consent conditions and, and rented. Um, so the, the grant um, provides consent conditions with a monitoring status per month. This is a new grant that we're using. Um, and the lag in the data so, uh, is because so for October and November, um, September and October, sorry, um, is due to the statutory 15-day appeal. So when a de decision is issued, there is a 15-day statutory um, period for the decision on the conditions, and also for the administration time um, to lodge an appeal. So that's why uh, September and October on the graph um, shows very, very few. Um, and monitoring has been commenced at least 20 working days um, from the date of issue of the consent, but it's often a lot longer than that. Um, so district plan breaches. Uh, this graph has shown the number of district plan ROPs received um, for potential breaches. They've obviously got to be investigated. Um, and this number remains pretty high. Um, and you know maybe due to the growth of the district and people sort of, you know, noticing what what may be doing and everything like that. Um, for so the monitoring team do use the bail model uh, for compliance, um, and it's usually you know obviously first off advice letters, but if it becomes necessary, abatement notices are issued. Um, and the RMA allows monitoring officers to issue an abatement notice to direct an offender to actually do something or see something that's caused a breach um, of the RMA. Um, usually this is for breaches of the district plan and these can be issued for also um, failing to comply with the condition of a resource consent uh, which will make them comply with that condition. Um, so this is the number of abatement notices that have been issued. And um, if an abatement notice is issued, and within, they always have a specific date uh, that the offender must comply. Um, and if the offender hasn't complied within that time frame, or is not showing a willingness to cooperate with counsel, um, an infringement notice can be issued uh, for $750. Um, from this graph, if there hasn't been any issued, it's usually because we have got compliance from the offender prior to the time of issuing. Uh, COVID also with the lockdown period, the officers that haven't been to site, so there may be some gaps there um, on the months. Thanks, Rochelle. Members, any questions or comments? Please, Councillor Kendrick. Just an observation, there seems to be a lot more abatement notices issued this year than the previous numbers are not huge, but any particular reason of more monitoring or people misbehaving more? Yeah. Madam Chair, um, we have been monitoring um, a large number of consents. We have had a, the, we've got a fixed term monitoring officer and they have been in place uh, for the, uh, the past six months, so we have got more um, monitoring officers out there. With the higher number of RFS that have been coming in, obviously um, the district being reaching and everything like that, um, there has been you know, a number that have uh, needed abatement notices to get them moving along. Uh, so it's really around what, what is coming through the resource consents, sort of doing that backlog of monitoring as well, uh, where there may be some conditions that haven't been met for quite a significant period of time. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Member Smith, uh, Councillor Smith, sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rochelle. I was just curious how the um, environmental infringement notice fine, I guess you would call it, of $750 a set. Is that set through legislation or is that something that we set through an organisation? Um, just noting how few abatement notices are then formed into environmental infringements and what that cost to the organisation might be. Madam um, Chair, the 750 is set by legislation. Um, and yeah, so the, there are few environmental infringements notices issued. 
um, and that's really because we do get compliance once we've issued that abatement notice. We've, prior to issuing an abatement notice, we've done a lot of work with the customer and often when that abatement notice sort of goes on and gives them a specific time, um, they do end up complying or showing that willingness to comply. Um, but the infringement notice is um, that, that next step and then it would be going through to prosecution. Um, 750 is quite a significant amount to pay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? Madam Chair, if I may, uh, not directly related to the report, but we are seeing, <coughs> just received uh, Minister for the Environment releasing uh, a document for consultation and engagement with local government on the, in, on the changes to the, the um, RMA, and that involves the uh, Natural and Built Environment Act and also the Strategic Planning Act. The changes focus on more effort in plan making. I think you've heard that from Greg Wilson when he's made his presentations recently. Less emphasis on consenting, what that means in practice, we're not sure of at this point. Uh, broadened and enhanced compliance, monitoring and enforcement. Again, what that looks like exactly, we're not sure of, but it does suggest that with that shift in emphasis, that we will need to um, address that when, when the changes kick in, because monitoring the way we are at the moment is not not like opt, it's not ideal. We have one full-time staff member, one fixed-term staff member, and if this trend or this shift occurs, um, we need to look seriously at how we actually achieve that in the future. So um, I'll just raise that as information for for the committee at this point. Um, the latest document um, requests feedback by the 28th of February. So Greg's team and Rochelle's team will work closely together. It will probably be reported through the uh, Strategic Policy uh, Strategy Policy Committee um, uh, as a submission or a draft submit, submission for consideration of that committee uh, before it goes to Wellington. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Michelle, I was wondering if there has been any analysis of what the Section 9 breaches look like. What I'm trying to ascertain in my mind is whether we've got people that's just been a bit naughty or whether it's an interpretation challenge in our district plan that people might not be setting out to break the law, but they haven't understood what the RMA or the district plan requires of them and we're pinning them retrospectively or a combination of the both? Madam Chair, um, I think it's a combination of, of those. There's certainly uh, people who aren't aware of the district plan full stop um, and feel that they can just go ahead and do what they, they wish to do and they get a complaint made against them and we go and investigate and they can be like, oh crikey, I just really didn't know. Um, but then there are the ones that basically do know the rules but will go ahead and do things providing that, you know, they can get away with it. Um, and you do find that there is generally, uh, for the ones that didn't know about it, there's generally a willingness to comply. Um, and so they just need the assistance to actually get across the line if they can do, or retrospectively we, um, they need to get a re resource consent for what they have actually um, done. And then there's others that haven't got that willingness to comply and they never will, and those are the ones that we need to go down that enforcement track with. So definitely a combination. Thank you. Um, yes, Member Ward. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, just an acknowledgement to staff, actually, at community board level, uh, we have been requesting in our action sheets for some time now to be receiving um, resource consents to comment on, which hasn't been happening. And I'd just like to say this last month, um, well, we received six resource consents in our subdivision, in our, in our ward area, uh, predominantly uh, Kiri Kiri Kawakawa. Um, so just want to acknowledge, thank you for um, closing that gap. We may have a long list. Excellent. No other comments? Okay. I just responded back. Oh, I just was disagree with the community board agenda and I think be careful what you ask for because now they're all complaining that we're not resourced to respond to all those resources. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Okay, item 5.4.
the recommendation is that the regulatory compliance committee receive the report district services monthly business report for October 2021. And may I have a mover and a second, please? And yeah, okay, so we've got Deputy Mayor and Council of Leadership, please. Thank you. And does anybody have any questions um, or, or comments on this report? Nothing. Um, yay, the library's team is what I, I had. Um, yeah. Justin, sorry. If there are no questions, all is good, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> I'd be more than happy to take questions on any of the content. is that the Regulatory Compliance Committee <laughs> receive the report building services update. I think it's too cold. I'm getting me. Okay. Happy to move, Madam Thank Chair. you, Councillor Smith and Council of Research. Thank you very much. And we will have Treat up shortly and Dolly's going to turn up the temperature. And I'm really struggling. Is that a table wider? It is a laid out white. Yeah, I can't see. Every time they put their hands up, I can't see them. We're just yelling at some better crowd playing. They've been yelling. <laughs> we, we should open up the virtual and you should put your hand up. <laughs> In the virtual. Better, paper dark. Better, better control. Better. Good to see you there. Okay. Is he ready? Trent, you are online. Are you able to hear? Sorry, I'm not speaking. I sure can, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> hear, me, hear me okay? Yep, welcome. Um, so Thank we you. received you. your report. The floor is yours. And then we'll have questions. Um, so I believe I've sent some slides to Marlena. Is she going to put those up or do you want me to share the screen and do it from my end? Share your screen, Trent. All right, let's give that a go. While Trent's doing that, Madam Chair, all is good in the world of um, the BCA. Um, and Trent will highlight that on his slides that are coming up. Um, yeah, I won't say more than Okay. I'll carry on. So the forecast for the 2022 year is 1,531 cents. Um, we're tracking quite well with that. As you can see from this slide, we've pretty much matched the numbers for last year. So consents remain high. Um, the team's performing well. Currently, we're still sitting above the 99 percentile for the year to date in the way of compliance for building consents and also for CCCs. Um, so the focus is to keep that throughout the rest of the year. Uh, we move to building compliance. Um, RFS numbers are down on the same period to October for last year. Um, swimming pool inspections, they conducted 68 pool inspections to the end of October. Um, other items in the building compliance realm are COAs with 29, infringements 17 issued, notice to fixes 48 issued for the period to the end of October, and 111 BWAF audits. Um, and that concludes for today. Any questions? Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, Trent. Um, this morning we had a wonderful uh, risk workshop and one of the questions, and I, I can't claim, claim the credit for it, but it was a brilliant question that Bruce Robertson put up was um, in, the building, uh, in the building scene, the supply chain issues are causing some tension and is there any risk for the Farmers District Council in the future 
with people taking shortcuts or using non-approved products as we get through the supply chain challenges. It's probably more pertinent given the significant number of building consents we've seen coming through. And I can almost anticipate your answer because I know you're all professionals and really good at your job. But um, he, did, he did allude to the fact that it is a risk in this country and we should be asking these questions. Um, through the Chair, Councillor Court, the, the reality is I'm pretty confident in our inspectorate. Um, we're very aware of um, uncertificated products. We've had the odd issue in the past, so we're very diligent on that. And look, one thing, one feature that has come about because of that is amendments to cladding systems where they've been unable to get, for example, um, James Hardy products. So they've had to change the exterior cladding, which results in an amendment and they'll use some other product that's more readily available. So yeah, pretty, pretty confident that's a reasonably low risk because we're aware of it and the inspectors are keeping an eye out. Thank you. Good question. Thank you for that, Trent. My question actually relates to um, the comments under discussion and next steps in the report around the BCA will continue to train and grow its competence and capability. And I guess with my Mayor's Task Force for Jobs hat on, we're more and more aware of the need to retain our rangataki in our district, especially in COVID times for the the lack of desire to move away from home and this uncertainty. So my question is whether there is any uh, work stream happening within your team to look at how to grow that workforce from the bottom up and retain some of our rangatahi in our district. Um, through the chair, at the moment we're focused on building what we have in the in the current team and I think you know there's a little more reliance on contractors at the moment. When I talk about building capacity and capability it's having the existing FDE count um, fully trained. Um, we have a few new starts. It's very competitive in the BCA realm at the moment looking for staff and what we've found is a lot of the incumbent staff that work for councils have transferred out into the private sector which has left a bit of a gap. Um, I was recently in a uh, we went down to a conference in Wellington with um, Boynes and one of the questions I asked them is what were they doing as our professional body to um, enable like through schools looking at our, our realm as a career option for someone leaving school. So it's definitely on the table they're thinking about it. My understanding is they have come up with some literature on it and I've, I've yet to sort of see that myself but it is happening. Thank you, Trent. Councillor Research. Yeah, good day, Trent. Um, good presentation you did. I just had a question of why it wasn't actually included in the report so everybody could actually see the nice graphs and pictures. <laughs> the numbers are there, um, but we could table the report if that's okay with if it's through the chair, I prefers the picture. The pictures being in the report itself, we can certainly do that. I, I can no, answer. No I can include them, but also if you look to the district services report, all of the graphs yeah. that I've included in the slides today are actually in that report. Yeah. Oh, you just failed the test. It's just that it's. No, look, I'm not asking this, so I've made it noticeable. And. And Malema, our lovely Dolly, did an amazing job making sure that all the graphs in that report, all the reports were readable. Yep. It's a big job because they come to be read as a different file. Thank you. Thanks for that, Trent. Thank you, Madam Chair. No other questions on that item? All those in favour? Aye. 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 Okay, item 5.6. And the recommendation is that the Regulatory Compliance Committee receive the report action sheet update November 2021. Thank you to move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Smith, Councillor Research. Thank you very much. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Well done. We should say well done. No outstanding moment, you Yeah. You guys are, I, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge Dean and his team. Um, or, you know, we've had some curly things raised in this forum. 
part of this meeting and um, you know in response to items that have come up at other other council meetings you guys have action a response in a really timely manner so that's awesome. and so i'm going to do a closing kind of care but you're not all leaving because we've got a quick workshop on our work program okay so you're glued to your seats Kia tō, kia tātou katoa, te atawhai o tō tātou āraki, o ihu kuraiti, me te aroha o te atawa, me te whipinga tangitanga, ki te wairua taku, āke, āke, āmene. Āmene.